to begin by showing you the progression that we're on as a church. We began the summer with what do Christians believe, if you remember that. What do Christians believe? We believe in one word, the Bible is the word of God. That's hugely important to understand. That's what Christians believe. The Bible is the word of God. Culture doesn't change the word. The word changes culture. The word is the foundation of, of what we believe uh, about God, about his uh, son, our savior, um, how we're to live, which is the next part. So we started with the Bible being the word of God, and we proved why the Bible is unlike any other book that's ever been written. And there are multiple proofs for that. Uh, and why it is the Word of God. If you take out the Word of God, you run into what we're running into as a nation today. That people, we run into what we run into as a nation today. Then we went to one God. There is one God. Not all gods are the same God. There is one God. Jehovah, Yahweh, God, God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We believe there's one way to God. That's through Jesus Christ, his Son. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. There is no other salvation except in Jesus. We believe in one spirit. There are many spirits in that realm. We know that the enemy is in that realm, demons are in that realm, but Christians believe in one Holy Spirit that is also God. The Holy Spirit is not an it, he's a he, okay? He is a person. And so we believe in one spirit and we believe in one hope that Jesus is coming back again someday. Now within Christianity, there are some different beliefs within that, especially in the one hope. When is Jesus coming back? You know, uh, you know I don't know. No one knows when he's coming back. Someone said, I, I might have shared this with you, we're part of the welcoming committee, not the planning committee. So we don't know when Jesus is coming back, but all Christians believe that he is coming back. Why? Because Jesus said he was coming back. Then from what do Christians believe, we moved on to how do Christians behave? We live differently than the world. That we reflect Jesus, and then he produces, the Spirit produces in us the fruit of the Spirit. And we walked through all of that. Now we're starting a new series in 1 Peter. So what do Christians believe? How do Christians behave? And now what is the result of being a Christian in a world that's not our home? What is the result and how do we live in a world that is not our home? These are odd times that we live in. And it's interesting that the believers are the odd ones. Isn't that something? from the world standards, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. I want to read, with you, read uh, to you and with you Isaiah 5, 18 through 24. Okay? So again, it's another, another preacher I heard, different days, same demons. Different days, same demons. So the same things that other believers, and this is going all the way back to Israel as a nation that they went through, we face today because it's different days, but it's the same demons that are, that are working. Isaiah 5, 18 through 24 says this, What sorrow for those who drag their sins behind them with ropes made of lies, who drag wickedness behind them like a cart. They just carry their sins with them. And that, not in a sense that they've not been forgiven and they're holding on to the baggage. No, they want everybody to know what's in their cart. They want everybody to know what they're selling. And that's their sins. They're proud of their sins. They even mock God and say, well, hurry up and do something if you're God. We want to see what you can do. Let the Holy One of Israel carry out His plan, for we want to know what it is. You see, that's mocking. That's mocking God. Does any of this look familiar in our day? What sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil. That dark is light and light is dark. That bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. What sorrow for those who are wise in their own eyes and think themselves so clever. 
What sorrow for those who are heroes at drinking wine and boast about all the alcohol they can hold. Wow, what an interesting day that we live in. I'm surprised by a lot of things, and I'm surprised by the, uh, the complete acceptance of unlimited alcohol consumption. Let me just say that, okay? Uh, it's just everywhere and in everything. It's just become so much a part of our culture. And what I read recently is there's a rise in women alcoholics. Isn't that interesting? We would always, we even think of that as men being more susceptible to alcoholism because of how the culture went after the men. There's a huge rise in women in America becoming alcoholics. Do you know why? Does anybody know why? Wine. Wine has become the in thing and the hobby and so on and so forth. And, you know, we all have to make our decisions, but we do know drunkenness is against the will of God. But the door has been opened, and whenever the enemy opens the door, there are problems that, that come in. Okay? So they're heroes at drinking wine and boast about all the alcohol they can hold. I was at a, a football game a couple years ago and sitting in front of us. And listen, I don't go to football games expecting uh, you know, us to sing Amazing Grace, Our Chains Are Gone. I understand. I'm not so naive or stupid. But the, the person sitting in front of me, I don't know who they were. They were like, well, if I wasn't here, I'd just be home getting drunk. I thought to myself, that is so sad. That's really the goal? That's really all you have in life? Like, I wasn't angry at him. I was heartbroken for him. That's your goal? Now, he might have been showing off uh, for his friends, and I, I get all of that as well. But what sorrow? For those who are heroes at drinking wine and boast about all the alcohol they can hold, they take bribes to let the wicked go free, and they punish the innocent. It still goes on today. It still goes on today. I believe in punishing the guilty. I believe the justice of God is part of the character of God. But I also believe in justice, where it's not just the rich ones that get off because they can afford uh, better attorneys. Therefore, just as fire licks up stubble and dry grass shrivels in the flame, so their roots will not and their flowers wither, for they have rejected the law of the Lord of heaven's armies. They have despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. So it, this was about 600 years before Christ. Let's say this was 2,600 years ago. Different days, same demons. The more things change the more they stay the same. So it was the same in Peter's day as he's writing, and that's why 1 Peter is so relevant to us, because we're still dealing with some of these things, because we still live in a world that's, that's not our home. It's not the world that God has called us to. So we're going to spend several weeks, this is a bit of an overview this morning, on 1 Peter and how do we as believers live in a world that's not our home. And the first word we're going to focus on, which was our theme verse for today, is hope. 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 1 Peter, uh, hope means a, a brighter future. It, 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 it means that the future is better than the past and better than the present. Our hope is, is in heaven and our hope is in God. And we know that as believers, our best days are always ahead of us. Our hope is not based on feelings or emotions or circumstances or, uh, you know, the wind of culture, whatever is taking place. That's not our hope. Our hope is not that everyone on the planet is going to get saved someday. I mean, that is a wish. But that's not going to happen according to the Word of God. There will always be people that reject the Word of God. Our hope is that we have heaven in store for us. But while we're still here, that's the question. How are we to live in a world that's not our home? Well, 1 Peter 1.3 says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, he establishes from the very beginning that we have God who is our Father and we have a Lord, we have a new king, and his name is Jesus. In his great mercy, not because we've earned it, he has given us new birth into a living what? 
hope through what? Come on, say it. The resurrection from the dead. See, our hope is in Jesus Christ based on the foundation of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I just think that sometimes we have to be careful as believers that our foundation is not shaken by what's going on around us because our foundation is not shaken. Because it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He has risen from the dead. He is who he says he is. He's proved it. And everything he said is true. The Bible is true. And so we focus on what the Bible says and not what other people might say. 1 Peter 1.21 Through him you believe in God who raised him, what? From the dead. Who raised him from the dead and glorified him. So your faith and hope are in what? God. God. Our faith and our hope are in God. Where should we not put our faith and hope? Okay, in ourselves, for sure. The heart is deceitfully wicked above all else, right? Just follow your heart. That is the worst advice I've ever heard. Okay, what else? We don't put our hope in the world. Okay, who controls the world in which we live in? Satan, the prince of the power of the air. His kingdom wars against God's kingdom. Where else do we not put our hope? In the government. Aren't you just thrilled that the elections are coming up again and we get to watch all of that unveil in front of our eyes? Honestly, if I thought that running my head into a cinder block wall would help, I would do it. And I actually think it's less painful than watching some of the stuff that we're going to see in the next year or so. Oh. Do you know, not our church... Do you know the churches that were, were divided and died through the COVID time because so many people loved their political view more than they loved Jesus? Isn't that interesting? Isn't that sad? They were more sure of their political view than they were of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's sad. To me, that's sad. Not here. We thrived. Thrived and grew. Continue to grow. Uh, why? Because we kept focusing on Jesus. Kept focusing on Jesus, on Jesus. Love God, love your neighbor. That's how we try to do it. Isn't that an odd concept? Love God, love your neighbor. Who glorified him so that your faith and your hope are in God. Okay? 1 Peter 3.15, next verse. But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Okay? Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the what? The hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. If we can expound upon the Republican platform or the Democratic platform better than we can expound upon the Word of God and why we believe Jesus is the Son of God based on the resurrection, if we can expound our political views better than our uh, uh, Christian views, You've wasted a lot of time. And we don't know how much time we have. We don't give an answer based on our voting record. We give an answer based on the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Why he is the only hope. Isn't it interesting? The the more we try, the the more that we get rid of of Jesus and the hope we have, the more hopeless people become. Hmm. And again, we're not to judge the world. That's the world. But we have to be careful that it doesn't get into our own hearts and into our own church and into our own lives. Our hope and the foundation of hope, expectation of a bright future, is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And nothing is going to stop that because it's happened. No one and nothing is going to stop his return because... He said it's going to happen. Living in a Christian uh, is feeling odd in a world that considers you odd. We're kind of the odd man out. We used to be on the bandwagon. Now we're being run over by the bandwagon. And yeah, you know, I'll tell you why. It's because Christians just lost their focus. We just focused on things that God didn't want us to focus on. And so we became weak and vulnerable and the enemy came in strong and we got nothing. You know, biblical 
um, illiteracy is a problem. It's a problem in the church, not in the world. In the church, read the word. Let me encourage you this week to read First Peter. Try to read it through. It's only five chapters. Read it through in one sitting. Okay, you can do it if you want to listen to it. I know some people listen to it on their way to work. That's a great way to do it. What a great time if you have a commute to use to redeem that time um, in that. And God can speak through that. My commute is about 30 seconds, and God has spoken to me in that 30 seconds. If your commute is like a half hour, imagine what God could do. Okay? Get the Word of God into your heart. Learn the Word of God. Go to Bible study. Come to the Bible study that we're having on Wednesday nights. We're starting at 6.30. We're going to run an hour, 7.30. The, and, and then let the Word of God speak. But anyway, we're, we're considered odd because we're living in a place that's not our home. The world is not our home. We're just passing through for a time. Our home is in heaven and in eternity. Listen to this. This is an interesting thought. That we are already living in eternity because we will never face the second death. Isn't that neat? We, as believers, aren't waiting for eternity. We're already living in eternity. We're just waiting for our bodies to die so that we can be with Jesus instantaneously and forever. How many times have we said, we're not looking for the grim reaper to come. We're looking for life to come. Those that don't know Jesus are looking for the grim reaper. When's death going to come? When's death going to come? We don't know that. But I'm ready for life. See, we're living life now, but someday, see, all the fullness of God, uh, we will experience all of that instantaneously. When we die as believers, instantaneously, we are in the presence of God. The fast is what the biblical writers could say, because they didn't have all the technology and things we do. The fastest they could say it is in a twinkling of an eye. And that's not even fast enough. That's what happens when the believer goes home, finally home, out of this world, their hope fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The book of 1 Peter was sent around to the individual churches. Imagine what it must have been like writing in that day and sending letters. We don't even send letters in our day now. Like my kids wouldn't have a concept of, uh, you know, writing, sitting, writing down, handwriting in cursive, which I don't do cursive either. I know there's a big thing about that. I, actually, I went from printing to cursive to illegible. That's kind of where I'm at. Kind of where I'm at in my, in my things. But to, to write a letter in our day is very rare. When's the last time you got a handwritten letter that was sent in the mail? I mean, maybe you do. I, you know, it's just, but imagine in Peter's day what that was like. Somebody had to say, I believe that what Peter's writing, I believe in it so strongly that I'm going to go and risk my life and make sure that letter from Peter gets to the people that it's supposed to get to. Now, I know our postal system is amazing, and I wouldn't want their job uh, either um, to, to get a letter for, I don't know how much stamps are anymore. That's how out of touch I am. But well, how much are stamps? Thousand dollars, yeah. But what are they for real? Okay, 66 cents. They will come to your door or your mailbox. They will take that letter for 66 cents and makes it get, make it get to my daughter in California for 66 cents. That's still a pretty good deal. Because if I had to get on a horse, she'd never hear from me. You see what I'm saying? Imagine what it was like, but it was so important that this letter got to the people. That the apostle Peter, that spoke with God, saw the transformed Christ went through an amazing transformation in his own life, had to share what God had put on his heart. That's how important this letter was. And you know what? It's just as important for us. So what does Peter write to the people of that day, and how does it relate to us in our day? Well, we've established different days, same demons, same things going back 2,600 years in Isaiah are still things that we, we face today. 
So whatever Peter wrote to the first century church is still very relevant to us today. So what did he say to them? What did he say to that church that was undergoing persecution? What did he say to the people that were the oddballs at work and in their society? What did he say to the people that lost friends because they no longer believed or behaved the way that the friends believe and behave? What what does he say to those people? He reminds them of the hope that they have in Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to see throughout the book of 1 Peter. He informs his readers of their living hope. Okay, what does he do? He informs his readers of their living hope. And again, here's our verse again, 1 Peter 1, 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, Uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In this part of the book, the first part, we'll start next week, we're going to walk briskly through 1 Peter. I'm not going to go so slow that we miss the bigger picture, but I don't want to go so fast that we miss anything. So I'm, I'm looking as we walk through this together, it's kind of a brisk walk through 1 Peter, all right? In this section, we're going to see Um, that grace and peace can be ours. Why? Why can we have grace and peace in the midst of turmoil in this world that's not our home? How can we have that peace? Because we have hope. We know that this world isn't the only thing. Maybe you've heard this. I, I really like this thought. I've shared it before. If you're not a believer, then earth is the only heaven you will ever experience. If you are a believer, earth is the only hell you will ever experience. For us as believers, earth is not the end. How do we have peace? We have a hope. That hope is not in my behavior, not in what I've done or am doing. My hope is in what Jesus did on the cross of Jesus Christ. I've simply accepted that, and I receive all the benefits of what Jesus did on the cross. Your hope is not in your better behavior. Okay, None of us behave the way God would want us to behave. Your hope is not that you're going to die sinless. We all die sinners. You get that, right? Saved by grace. I think sometimes people have this idea, I have to confess every single sin. You've sinned while I've been speaking. You don't even know it. Right? Grace covers all of that. You're not going to leave this this world. The only way you're forgiven is through the grace of Jesus Christ. You're still going to sin all the way up to death. That's good news because our sins through Jesus Christ. Now, don't forget, I'm not saying that you can take sin to heaven. What I'm saying is that you're going to die a sinner because we're rotten, miserable, stinking sinners saved by grace. It's grace that will get you to the other side, not your good behavior. That doesn't mean don't behave properly because there's blessings and examples and all of that. Don't, don't, Don't miss all of this. But it's grace that sustains us. Grace. Next, Peter exhorts. First, the first thing he does is inform. Then he exhorts his readers to a hopeful and holy living. That not only do we have the hope of the next life, but we're still to, excuse me, live a holy life pleasing to God in this world. How do we live in this world? Holy. What does holy mean? Separated. I've been se- I'm separated from the world, but separated unto God. I've given up my lusts and passion for the things of the world. Now my passion is for the things of God. Do you see that? That's living a holy life. 1 Peter 2.11, and we'll get to all this in the weeks that are to come. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles. This is not our home. We're outsiders in this world as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sexual desires. No matter what the world is doing, no matter how the world is living, no matter what's going on around you, you are to still live as a Christian. You can't use as an excuse everybody else is doing it. You can't use as an excuse, well, that's just old school. You can't use as an excuse, well, things have changed so much. In actuality, if you go back 2,600 years to Isaiah, Eh, they really haven't changed that much. See, it's just a lie the enemy tells. Well, you don't know what it's like in the world today. Well, the reality is, uh, yeah, 
We do. My grandparents don't, they actually do. I find it humorous sometimes. I apologize to younger generations, but shout out to older generations and all the difficulties they faced. I'm going to tell you a little story about Alfred on her birthday. She's 98 years old, lived through the Second World War, she was in Germany. At the end of the war, her, her and her family were walking down the road praying to run into Americans so that the Russian army wouldn't slaughter their whole family. Now that's going through some stuff. And glory to God, here she is. Hallelujah. Excited to be in church moving as fast as she possibly can at 98 years old. I don't know if she caught that one, but <laughs> she did. <laughs> to get to the house of the Lord. To get to the house of the Lord. Waiting for Sue to finish talking so that she could go home, but waiting patiently. <laughs> waiting patiently. Because she wants to be in the house of the Lord. Shout out to Sue. And I, I tease her, but you know, she, She's a wonderful woman of God doing the work of the Lord. Doing the work of the Lord. Shout out to her. Caring for those that might not be in church other than that. That's going through some stuff. See? I mean, I catch myself whining sometimes too. And I don't mean whining. I mean whining. <laughs> you get it? This is different. And, okay, okay. Just checking. Pastor said, whining's okay. Yeah, no, you're thinking of the wrong whining. I catch myself whining, and I think, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? So I couldn't find the remote to the TV. Everything is going to be okay. But in my heart, it's the greatest, most important thing on earth that I can't find the remote to the TV. Doors like, you've got like 12 remotes. Why don't you just pick one of those? They don't all work in the same way. One's for the surround sound, one's for the TV, one's for the Roku, one's for my headphones, so that I can, oh no, so that I can actually hear what's on the TV. <laughs> so I'm available for lunch today. Uh, anywhere that you want to go, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am available. I'm just teasing. But, you know, we think of some of these things, and it's like, man, alive. Instead, I have so much to be thankful for. And if we just start with Jesus, that's enough. If we just look at the blessings of, of him accepting us into his family, that's enough. Not to mention I have a beautiful home to live in, a car that, that drives food on the table, uh, a wife that has not changed the locks on the house yet in 33 years. Thank God. Thank God. Yet. Yeah. The locksmiths don't work today, dear. They don't work today. Anyway, the blessing. That's how we live in this life, in this world that's not our home. We live differently, but we live with the blessings of God on us. So we abstain from these things which wage war against your soul. The war is not for your body. The war is for your soul. The children and what they're facing is not for their body. It's for their soul. And I was praying as, as Pastor Joe was praying, oh God, raise them up to be like Daniel, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the middle of Babylon, being forced and coerced to conform to Babylon's ways and making a stand and saying, we will not conform. And Jesus will meet us where we're at. Oh God, raise up a generation of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Do you understand what I'm saying? Christ is our example of hope in difficult times. And lastly, Peter con con comforts his readers in the midst of their fiery ordeal. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 13. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through. 
There was teaching in the 80s. If you were, if you were a true person of faith, well, I guess I was never a true per person of faith because I've been through some stuff. And I'm imagining you must not, it, uh, if you listen to that, then you must not be a person of faith either because you're going through some stuff. No, that's not what the Word says. Because you are a person of faith, you will go through some stuff. You will go through fiery tire, tire, uh, trials. But what differentiates us is that we don't give up. We don't quit. We don't deconstruct our faith. We hold on to faith because we have a hope that things will be better, and things will be better for how long? For all eternity. So we don't quit when trials come. We say, glory to God, I'm still alive. God still has a purpose, and God can take these trials, and He can take this fire, and He can purify me through them so that I can be more like Jesus Christ, that someone else might come to know Jesus, that someone else will experience eternity. Don't be surprised by the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad or rejoice, for these trials make you partners with Christ Jesus. I want to be like Jesus, but I don't want to go through any stuff. You're partners with Christ in His suffering. That's what it says. Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in His suffering. Because Jesus went through suffering. How are we to be exempt from suffering when Jesus, who is our example, went through suffering? So that, here's what will happen. So that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing His glory when it is revealed to all the world. Now let me say this real quick, some background. Peter got a glimpse of Jesus' glory. Remember the Mount of Transfiguration? He's like, this is awesome. I want to stay here. Let's build a house, houses. Jesus is like, Peter, honestly, you just don't get it. My house is different than Elijah. And who else was on the Mount of Transfiguration? Moses. That wasn't a test. I just forgot. <laughs> Elijah and Moses. Yeah, they were great. A prophet and the lawgiver. But their house, you can't build a house for them on the same level as the house we build for Jesus. So Peter saw a glimpse of Jesus' glory, and he wanted to stay there, but it wasn't time. So when Peter's writing this through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's thinking, oh, these trials we're facing? Jesus went through some stuff. I'm going through some stuff, and I'm going to make it through because it's going to be wonderful seeing the glory when it is revealed to the whole world, when His glory is revealed for all eternity for all those that believe. Peter will get his wish to stay in the glory of God, just not yet. You, as a believer, your hope will be fulfilled in being in the glory and the presence of God for all eternity, just not yet. So while we're here, we're not going to give up. We're going to hold on to hope. We're going to live a holy life reflecting a holy God. And we're going to invite others to come into the family because there's room in the Father's house for everyone. Amen? So I, I try to finish my sermon about 95% done on Fridays before I go home. And I like to leave 5%. I say 95% because Saturday, Sunday, I often like to come in and something new will pop in and I have to tweak it or another thought. Well, I didn't finish up on Friday for whatever reason. And if, if, you've, if you are a cre you know, have to create something, uh, whether you're writing or cr whatever it is you're creating, sometimes it just flows, and it's like, wow, it just... And then other times it's like, what am I going to do on Sunday? They're expecting a sermon. You know, that happens. That happens. And I j I've learned through the years, just walk away. Go do something else. And the Lord will give it to you. He has for 35 years, thousands of sermons. He's never failed me yet. He's been slow a few times. 
So anyway, I get in Saturday not having the, the sermon done, and I said, Lord, I just want, just, I just need a little bit more. I know I could preach what I have, but I don't think it's done yet. I need something to conclude with. And I opened up my email, and I get an email devotional from a man named Dr. Uh, Richard Dresselhaus. He was a former uh, assistant superintendent of the Assemblies of God. And it's called One for the Road. And I, and I opened it up because I just wanted to unwind and just, just take a few moments. And I opened it up. And on Saturday, this was his devotion. Dual citizenship. One is here and now, and the other is then and there. I thought, okay, Lord, I got it. Thank you. I literally said, thank you. Let me go on. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Little wonder that you don't feel at home in this world. So God was speaking to Dr. Dresselhaus and all of us in the same way at the same time. It's because you're out of place. And longing for a reality of heaven, it's a spiritual reality now, and one day it will be a physical reality. It's the moment you look forward to when Jesus will come to take his place and his people and take them to heaven. But in the meantime, enjoy your place with Christ, who is already in the heavenlies. See, now is just a foretaste of what it will be in the future and he closes, and I will too. So be encouraged. Although evil abounds, lift your eyes heavenward and rejoice in your dual citizenship. And all God's people said, Amen, amen and Amen.